Krister Dahlgren, thank you so much for having me out in Wilmington. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I can't tell you. So you're the principal lead on the X300 project, which is one of the most exciting projects that I've ever seen in the nuclear world. So I can't tell you how excited <laughs> I am to be here talking to you about this. Well, thank you. But before we get into the specifics of the technology, and I'll grill you on every aspect of it in a minute, I want to hear a little bit about you. You grew up in Sweden? Yes, I did. What was that like? What part of Sweden? Um, it's close to Stockholm. It's a town called Sala. It's a couple of hours north of Stockholm. Small town. Sweden had nuclear energy. Yeah, a lot. When you grew up. More than half of the electricity in, uh, in Sweden is generated from nuclear power. Wow. Back then. And, OK, so when you, um, when you were growing up, is this something that people knew about and loved? Was it something people mm -hmm. didn't know about, just like any other infrastructure? I grew up. I, I was born in 1970, so I remember both Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. OK. And Chernobyl especially was, <clears throat> it did hit our area. We got nuclear fallout from Chernobyl, where I lived. Yeah. And uh, so that was, it was you know, was I was it you guys probably, who detected it? Was it the Swedes? Yeah, who, like, the Swedes force mark planted. Yeah, because <laughs> one uh, somebody came in from the parking lot, uh, forgot that he had uh, left something in the car, went back out to get it, and he set off radio, the alarms coming <laughs> out. I think that's how it worked. I mean, it's probably many stories. Yeah. But that, so they started looking for a leak at the plant first. And then they realized it was in the parking lot. So how did that color your perception of the industry? Well, back then I was, you know, very young. So, you know, you, you hear what the news is telling you. You hear uh, what everybody around you is saying. But uh, you can't see it, smell it, taste it. You don't really know what's there and if it's there or not. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was, we had a, I remember having a referendum. <clears throat> and my parents, you know, they were kind of, they were anti nuke back then in like good environmentalists oh, yeah. Then, yeah so they were like dragging me out and like handing out these pamphlets <laughs> against nuclear and stuff growing up so yeah uh, is definitely. the dinner table conversation now awkward no it it, it was <laughs> fine it, things have changed so much since then yeah you know public so? perception um just everything so yeah there's still negative views of nuclear in sweden but if you look at what they have accomplished it's basically carbon free electricity system. Sweden's like the perfect system. example. Yes. As far as any country goes Sweden, from a carbon Finland, footprint. Uh, Sweden, Finland, and France, I think, are some Amazing. of the best ones. Canada, Ontario is great. And you guys too. use it to power industry yep. and all sorts. Of, I mean, like, I mean, it's critical. Even uh, you know, I just came back from South Korea, and they're turning against nuclear for some crazy reason. That was so critical to them becoming an industrial powerhouse. Right. I mean, you, especially on an island, you don't have that much space. I don't understand. The, does the minister? I, I understand that there's political pressures one way or another. But the minister of the economy, whoever he is at any given time, has to have someone in his ear, being like, "No, no, no you don't understand. The reason that we're a powerful country is because mm -hmm. of nuclear." Right. No, I don't. I don't understand it either. And in Sweden, there's more dynamics than, <laughs> and then just real like it's not just. Uh, what should you call it? It's very subjective, right? And But there's also a big union in Sweden, and obviously the nuclear power employs a lot of people. And so there's a lot of competing forces for and against. Uh, I think there's a lot of wind power being developed in Sweden. And so now the their share of the power has grown, but their average availability is 20%. <sighs> so you have to build five times more. And then you, you need gas to back to that up. Well, in Sweden, they use hydro to back it up, so it's actually still available. You can do that. Um, is hydro good all year long, or there's still yeah, some? Yeah, in Sweden, you can use it. Okay, much. in Sweden, yeah. yeah. It depends on the situation yeah. and how much you have. But hydro has been, in Sweden, has been expanded to as far as you can take it. There are no more um, flood, or what is it called, any more rivers you can take power from. And so they're, they can't expand it anymore. The wind is growing. And nuclear is shrinking. Mm. They're shutting. They've shut down a few plants. They're shutting down a couple of more. It looks like. But so. Sweden does have a little carve out where you're allowed to replace existing nuclear infrastructure with new nuclear infrastructure. Correct. Does anyone talk about deploying a reactor there? Not, not, not at the moment. I mean, the, what about you? I would say that <laughs> the debate, though, the public debate has definitely taken off in Sweden in the last few months. Last so few months? Yeah. Oh, so I'm like, behind the like times. Maybe six months. Okay. It's been slowly building. So there's. Tell me, what are the what's the conversation? Oh, it's just uh, that we shouldn't rule it out, and uh, we should keep the two plants that are they're planning on uh, shutting down next. That we should keep them going because Sweden is in general an energy exporter, 
But if you don't export, then there'll be coal in Germany or Poland instead. You know, so we're actually providing clean power to all of our surrounding countries in, <laughs> in Europe. And that's so, got to be good for the economy to be able to sell power. I feel like that, that should be a good thing, right? Yeah, it should be. You can also, I mean, it's, it's clean, so it's good. It depends on how, how seriously you take the carbon issue. I mean, right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's debated here in Sweden. I mean, in the U.S., it's kind of debated, right? The climate change is a yeah. debate here. Sweden might actually to, benefit from When I went change. to Finland, it was more like a triage type of situation. I've cut myself and I need yeah. to stop the bleeding. It's yeah. a completely different attitude when it comes to the climate change and how, how people's attitude towards that issue plays out in the public. Yeah. It's completely different. Though, I don't know, on the climate change issue, I get upset sometimes because I'm on the side, obviously, that feels like climate change is a problem. But on that side are a whole bunch of people who while they say it's a problem, are not, they're so proud of themselves for being pro-science, but then don't take the next step to become pro-math. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? No, I, I agree. And uh, there's a, you can call it, it used to be a contrarian thought, but you can decarbonize with nuclear. It's not that contrarian, really. If you know, you can do it. But uh, the nuclear comes with a stigma that we just have to try to get over somehow. So, okay, so how did you get over it as a kid? Your parents um, are dragging you to anti nuke rallies. Well, I, yeah, no, not, yeah, maybe not that bad, but <laughs> we, we were definitely not pro when I was a little kid. But I mean, it comes with uh, reason to me. It's like it's big, it's small, and it's relatively cheap, and it's, rel it's very safe compared to the other power production, especially if you look at deaths or if you look at actual outcomes, consequences. Nuclear is extremely safe. And so it just kind of, if you're a reasonable person, I mean, you can put those things together and say, that's a great alternative. And the best thing about it, I think, is that it takes very a little space compared to other plants. Yeah. And leaves very little visible waste. Like, there's no piles of things. The other thing that's so good about it, at least in my experience working at a plant, is that the community that has the plant flourishes. Yeah because it pays well, you have a lot of people that work there, um, you know, they're good supporters of the local communities. You usually have great support in the areas around the nuclear plant. It's, uh, and so, yeah, so one of the things we're trying to do is look at staffing. So it's kind of a two-edged sword because staffing is one of the higher costs for nuclear. With your new design, yeah. one of the things that you're looking at is reducing Correct. the total number of people that it takes to operate right. it. Because of the, in the levelized cost of electricity, you know, you have capital, fuel, O&M, and decommissioning. And it, is it still, it's still going to have some people though, right? It's not oh, yeah, totally autonomous. Yeah. So then We're not it... trying to do anything radical like remote control or something, no. but uh, GE has helped, you know, the gas business done that, do that. Yeah. So we have the capabilities within the big GE to help us come up with a different staffing model. So it's a little bit of a two-edged sword here, but it, it could just, be viewed uh, that way. But on the other hand, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that argument because <coughs> I would say um, the cheaper that it, if it's new, mm -hmm. the cheaper that it is, the more you build of them. Correct. And so yes, maybe you drop down from 800 people to 80 people. But instead of having one plant that has 800, being able to afford one plant that has 800 people, you can now afford 20 plants each Correct. with 80 people. So now you've got 1,600 true. people. Yeah, no, you're right. And so, yeah, we have to look at that. And, but, but that's basically the idea, is to be able to run it with a much fewer people with more centralized support. But so tell me, how did you, we still haven't heard your story about how you actually got I'm into sorry. the field itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I got in the field because I was um, taking energy, I had like an energy school classes in college, energy engineering, and I got really interested in power production and like the Rankin cycle. I was, that was really fun to me. Yeah. <laughs> it is still really fun. <laughs> and, uh, and I just, I don't know exactly how I got into nuclear, but I got into the nuclear program at the uh, Royal Institute of Technology. And that's one of the <laughs> premier uh, universities out there. In Stockholm, yeah, in Sweden, yeah, there's a few, but that one is, it's, it's good, yeah. And so I went to the nuclear program there and I graduated and I had a I think the I really got the bug and when I did my master's thesis at school about they had a small actually it wasn't modular but it was a small reactor in the center of Stockholm 
that provided district heat for Stockholm mm. for a very long time in the 60s and 70s. And I did my master's thesis on a uh, incident at that plant where they had a flooding event. So I did a master's thesis to, to investigate that flooding event and see like thermohydraulic analysis and and those consequences and, and so on. It was, it was really interesting. District heating, I mean, could that be another point of entry to the market that's a little bit simpler <clears throat> to kickstart a revolution in, in new nuclear? I mean, there's so much demand for district heating across the world. I yep. mean, you, you run across Northern Europe, uh, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, um, China even, and there's so many areas where district heating right now is powered by coal. And it, it seems to me like, for all the things that the nuclear industry is, all the pro problems, quote unquote, that they're trying to solve, let's say like high pressure, you wouldn't even have that with mm -hmm. this. You could just drop a core in the middle of a giant pool and then pump that pool around the city. Yeah, there are plants like that, plant designs that have been developed for district heating specifically, but it's also very easy to adapt the Rankine cycle for district heating. You can take what's basically waste yeah. and sell it as heat. It's, it's very simple. So how does that a, lot work? Of, a lot of coal plants do it. In, already that's what they do they generate electricity and district heat i see and you take just an extraction point so they uh, already have pressure turbine and which is like you know two atmospheres pressure and maybe a little bit more than 100 degrees c sorry 230 f fahrenheit no no or we're engineers we do yeah, see here exactly. <laughs> that's fine and so in that case you know you use that heat it's waste heat yeah. the stuff that we're going to pump out in a river or to a cooling tower anyway yeah. You pump it to a big heat exchanger and warm up your city with it. And uh, it's a very good entry point for a nuclear plant, for a light water reactor, I think. Yeah. As long as we can solve the siding issue. What's the siding issue? Uh, like, as in, um, well, you have to put it somewhat close to the town, right? So and you have to find a place for it. And why is that a problem? Why, if. Why, why are we hung up on the idea of remote siting? Why can't we put them in the middle of a city? What's wrong with that? I th personally, I think we can. <laughs> and we did. In Sweden, we did it. <laughs> but uh, the rules, like if you look at some countries' rules, they're not adapted for small plants, right? They're all one size fits all. And the size that they've had so far has yeah. been large. So their site boundary and all this stuff is just very, very big. Yeah. And it's a number. It's not based on the power. It's not based on size. It's just a number. And so those types of issues, you would have to go in and go and challenge those and see if there's a different way to write up the rule. And I think the US NRC just did it for small modular reactors. They changed the EPC site boundary. EPC uh, dose, for instance, for EPZ, small let's spell that yeah. out for the crowd. Oh, sorry. Emergency protection zone, where you would have to evacuate people in case you had something really bad happening. And plants. so they made an actual change that said yeah, small well, enough. The NRC has proposed a change for small reactors to use a different set of rules. Yeah. So in other countries, you would have to follow something like a, a framework like the NRC set up or something different. And I th there's also activities in the IAEA, International Atomic in Energy Agency in Vienna, mm -hmm. to do the same thing for international markets. And so how did you transition from a student in Sweden to working for GE? Oh, that's a good journey. <laughs> so after Sweden, um, I went to the US. I met my wife in Sweden. She's from America. She has Swedish relatives. So she was there for grad school. And so I went over here to work for like six to nine months at Maryland for on a project related to RBMK, the Russian reactor. I okay. don't know that acronym. Sorry, but it's the one that uh, Chernobyl. Yeah, uh, it's the Chernobyl type reactor, and uh, we'll just call it channel type reactor. So it we're was not. more like uh, Ignalina, the one in Lithuania, yeah. which they, where they actually filmed the, the movie, but okay. uh, or the series. I haven't seen it yet, but anyway, sorry. So anyway, so I went over here, and then while I was here, I really liked it. <laughs> you know, it was pretty awesome to be in the U.S. <laughs> in '95. What, what, what did you like about it specifically? I, no one cared what you wear. No, I mean it was like <laughs> I was in D.C., so it was super nice. I mean, just like, but good weather. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of good things. About it. <laughs> good food. I mean, everything was good. Yeah. It was, it's still good. I, I love it here. I like America too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> and so it's that simple. No, so I said, maybe we should stay. So I, we did stay, and I started the PhD program there at College Park. Cool. And so instead of doing RBMK PhD, I did uh, 
We had a test loop that was a scaled facility, scaled version of the BMW plant that was uh, Three Mile Island. Who knew College Park had so much nuclear stuff going yeah, on? Yeah, they used to have a really good department. I didn't I'm know that. Sure, right now they're not. They don't. They're not as strong. There's a reactor there. Okay. And uh, they had this test facility. I'm not sure that they still have it, but we did, and we ran these uh, simulated loss of coolant accident cases basically daily, and I was modeling it with a code called Relap Five, mm. and. Uh, made a model out of it and that was kind of my PhD thing and at the same time I was also working at a consulting company called ISL which really helps the NRC with different computer codes just manages them and uh, keeps them updated and runs cases with them and so on so I ran I worked there part-time but then at the end of that career I was really asking these questions like so how do you start up a plant or how do you what do you do if you have to shut it down in the middle of a cycle I mean, how many people operate? In, and no one had really actually worked at a plant that I really was working with. So yeah. I decided to move to Michigan and work at a plant at Palisades. Uh, and what were you doing wife. there? I was a reactor engineer, licensing engineer. Wow, so, so you went from... So tech spec engineer. That's not a, a common path, going from, uh, going from a PhD to becoming a, no, a reactor operator. Isn't. No, I wasn't an operator right away. <clears throat> Actually, I was an engineer first for a few years. And there were a few people that had PhDs. And not that I, I mean, yeah. I don't know if I needed a PhD to start working there. I wouldn't have needed a PhD <laughs> for that. Uh, but it was fun. It was good. I learned a lot. Uh, what, I did like refuelings and things. Yeah, what did you great. learn about being a reactor operator? Because I've had some. Uh, even right into the show being like, hey, the job's actually kind of boring. I'm just kind of It is kind of boring, but if you look at it like you learn something every day, yeah. like I learn something every day Would for you, a very, very long time. What kind of stuff do you learn? Well, you learn a little detail about a system or how they did yeah. the interlocks on this and that and how to tag something out, which is when you protect somebody, when you're replacing a pump, what tagging points and what problems you have and how to restore it. And there was always something new for the, I would say, for the first six years, it was always something new. Wow. And then it was always something you had done before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so six years, that's what it takes. It took a long time for me to get yeah. that feeling that the person that wrote into the show had, where yeah, it's yeah. like, wow, we've done this so many times. <laughs> I can't believe I had to explain this thing again <laughs> or something, you know? It was really fun though. I met some of the best people I've ever worked with there. Um, just people that really know how to operate a nuclear plant. Wow. And I was, you know, a very technical person, like a very analytical person, not so much a hands-on person. So that helped me a ton about being hands-on, knowing how to operate some equipment. And I'm not as good at some of those guys that have worked there forever, but also learning this command and control and taking control of a situation. Uh, and it was great, great experience. That program, being a senior reactor operator training, like going yeah. through the whole thing, including being on shift, is uh, something else. It's a huge resource that this country has. Uh, that probably not that meant only countries with nuclear has, but it's a great program. Yeah, and it's it's awesome. Okay, I learned more there, I think, than in my PhD. I mean, just like about sure, how nuclear practical plants hands work. On, and, yeah. But it's just like how nuclear plants work, like how they respond to certain transients and temperature changes and things like that. It's and, really And how do they respond? If you've got a, a transient in the core, um, does the pressure actually ever change in the system or is the pressurizer good at maintaining a common pressure? The no pressurizer what? can maintain the pressure. It depends on what's happening, really. It depends. There's several type of events that can happen. Um, you can have a leak, then it can't maintain pressure, right? If you have a break in a pipe, but if you have a loss of power, transient, and so on, it's pretty good at maintaining it. And, and you can, in a PWR that I worked at, you had steam generators that could help remove the excess heat and so on. So there was ways to... And what yeah. actually causes transients? Because it, as far as I know it, there's like three levels of like negative feedback in a PWR. You've got your uh, negative temperature feedback, you've got your, your Doppler negative feedback, and then you've also got your Void, negative void coefficient. So it seems to me like the, the system is so self-balancing. What would ever trigger a transient? The, only, the, the re bad ones are the cool downs. What, you what know, do you mean? If you cool down a plant, you get positive reactivity, right? Oh, so, I see what you're saying. So you're saying it's when, when we actually do something to it. Yeah. When well, we induce something a change. Ha well, or if something opens that you didn't expect to open. Like, what let's say open? a relief valve. Okay. They just pop open? Steaming off. Sure. 
and then it cools <laughs> down the plant and you have to... Why did relief valves just pop open? Things fail. <laughs> you don't know that until you've been at a plant. Yeah, apparently. It didn't happen to me, but I mean, they can happen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it happened in the industry. There are a lot of industry events like that where things just pop open, let's say, yeah. or fail, you yeah. know? And uh, so, so there are different types of events. Um, but I, I was on shift for, I think, four years, never had a trip on my shift. Wow. Yeah, that was kind of good. That's good, but not good. I would have liked to maybe have been in one, but I'd <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you don't have it. And when, when trip happens, it, is it all automatic? Um, there are a lot of things you have to, you should, you can let it all go automatically, but it's better if you are anticipating what's happening and starting it in a better way than automatic. So it's a bit handsy. Yeah. Depends on, you were trained to be more handsy than maybe the system requires, but it's for plant investment detection. Yeah. Yeah. And then so you, um, so you got all this practical experience, what did you do with it? Well, I worked there for a while and I learned a lot and then, um, like I, I think I mentioned, I got really bored and like just tired of it, unfortunately. I mean, I look back at it and I guess I take a fork in a road and you have to kind of not dwell on it. You know, what could have been, could have, would have, should have, but I came here. Yeah. Because <laughs> I went to Sweden on vacation. I saw a, an ad for employment at GE. In Sweden? In Sweden, at a <laughs> Swedish site. So I was like, well, maybe that would be cool. So I applied for it and I got it. And my wife said, I don't want to move to Sweden. So then they said, apply down here then. And so I did. So I came here. Cool. And I started working on the ESBWR design as part of the giant team we had in place to do finalize the DCD, the, the design certification document for ESBWR. Um, and how many people were on that project at that point? Uh, just hundreds. I don't even know. I was just... Uh, All engineers. Yeah. A lot of engineers, a lot of project people, a lot of schedulers. A lot of procurement people. It was just we were gearing up for the nuclear renaissance, <laughs> right? And so the idea was the big, big you had a, a, several orders kind of in the works. We did, yeah. and you were getting the license. And then yeah. once you got the license, you could just start building these exactly. things all over the place. Yeah. But that was the plan at the time. Then the economics changed. Yep, two thousand nine hit, and it was you know both a downturn in the economy and upturn in plant costs. I guess yeah. So yeah. that's what happens, and. Um, what was your specific role on the SBWR? What parts were you working on? At that point, I was doing safety analysis and answering questions that the NRC had asked us. And what kind of questions would they ask? They would ask specific questions. I helped on uh, specific questions on natural circulation. I helped on specific questions on startup testing because I was the startup testing lead. Um, there's a whole chapter on startup testing. And so they asked questions about that, certain tests and what to, how to do them, or maybe they had detailed questions on test configurations and things like that. Um, so you're designing a new reactor now. When, as you design it, are you designing it in a way that anticipates some of the regulatory, the, the regulatory burden in licensing to Maybe not even design something that is how you would just design things from an engineering perspective, but design something to make the regulatory process flow easier for you. We're going to try. We're going to do pre-licensing efforts to try. What but, is pre-licensing? Uh, it's a, uh, a way to communicate certain key issues early to get, maybe not buy-in, but at least get an NRC review of it so they can write down what they think and what the concerns are, and maybe an optioneer with them to make sure we have a licensable design going in. And is this, but I don't think they give you, they don't give you a full evaluation. It's just you get what you get. You get somebody's opinion. It's not the full commission. And is this private? Is this public? The pre licensing? private. Yeah. And then by the end of pre licensing, you're like, we have a pretty good sense that we can get through this process in, yeah, in a certain amount of time. In a certain amount of time, certain amount of money. We can reduce the risks licensing risks of certain topics where we have um, changed the design from previous designs. We're trying to leverage the SPWR, right, in this design work. And so are you guys definitely going to pursue the NRC licensing no matter what, even if you were to deploy in a different country? Nope. So we've done it twice. We have two approved reactors, and we've built zero in the US. So each of those reactors take hundreds of millions it's not just NRC fees, but it's also design work. 
So we've already sunk quite a bit of money into this business. And we're, our current idea is to not do it a third time. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, we would do this <laughs> with a customer yeah. uh, or a, a group of customers, who knows, but uh, and do the site-specific licensing, not do the part 52, but do part 50 is our plan. But uh, we're still talking to <laughs> various people about this. But that, to me, it, I would say, you know, you say fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times. <laughs> that's, I'm like, that's a nuclear industry. You know, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's no point in for this supposedly cheap plant to spend hundreds of million just to go through licensing for a plant that won't be built because it won't be the site-specific design. Right. So, it, it, it and how different would sense. how different would a plant be from site to site? Well, it's mostly the structures that change and the, how you take care of the um, seismic and the, the dynamic interface with the ground and so on. And could one say, um, listen, we're we know generally, you know, we've looked at a whole bunch of sites that other nuclear plants maybe would consider, other electricity infrastructures on. We can say there are only so many different soil types. There's only so many different seismic regions. We are going to lock in on soil type B and seismic region C, and we are going to design for that. And you know what? We are only going to search for customers that will have a site with those two considerations. Yeah, I mean, you could do that if you if you wanted to. Um, and we we are looking into making generic site assumptions. Uh, the challenge there is not to be so bounded that you like overprice the plant so much because you want to build everywhere, like you said. So you need probably to the opposite. It. Probably you, you, you want to say yeah, yeah. But yeah, so this is something we're trying to work through right now to see what's the optimum approach. And, and what us. is your the overall design strategy? Can you talk me through like how does one design a nuclear plant from ideation through it actually getting built? <laughs> so the idea was. We have an idea, and, and that's and that resulted in a huge simplification of safety systems. And now the what was that idea? It, it was um, the elimination of the loca to make certain changes to how the plant is designed in order to be able to eliminate certain loss of coolant accidents from the design basis. Move it out to beyond design basis. And uh, once you did that, there were a lot of simplifications that could be made on the system level. And system level changes made for a smaller plant. And now the design work is to be able to keep that core, the core systems that remain um, at the that remain at the highest safety class and fit them in the most optimum structure possible. And our goal is to reduce all the quantities by greater than 90% for an 80% size or twenty percent size reactor. Okay, I the see the math original. there. So yeah. it's twice as cheap if you say. Yeah. Because we also know that the quantity, especially concrete, is what drives project costs. At least historically for us, if you look at our old con uh, projects, the cost of putting the concrete in the ground is actually what's dominating the project costs. And why not go after that? Why why not design a a nuclear plant that doesn't need concrete? Or needs like just enough con concrete to bolt, like a pad to bolt the, the plant to, but nothing more. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, you still need safety class one concrete, like the highest safety class seismic category one, because you have highest ses ca seismic category systems in it. So the concrete needs to hold up, or the systems will just fall apart. They're supported and, by the structure. And why not steel a few steel plates and steel poles that go thirty feet into the ground to just lock it into the ground? Why not something like that? Well, it. Uh, well, we've always. <laughs> I'm not going to say we've always done it that way, but <laughs> we do need a room for this to be in. Is it? Is it? Didn't you tell me a yeah. year ago that your one job on the team is yeah. to make sure <laughs> exactly. that the we don't engineers say it. don't say that? <laughs> <laughs> but we've. There, it's about breaking down those those preconceived notions on what the nuclear plant looks like. Yeah. So that's what we're working on right now, but. Uh, there are a lot of creative ideas. We think that putting it underground has a lot of benefits from external uh, hazards. Yes. And uh, we think that optimizing on concrete structures instead of optimizing the mechanical piece, like 
it's a suboptimal layout from a mechanical arrangement, mm. but it's optimal optimized for construction. Because you're you're wrapping pipes and stuff around each other, almost like a, a car. Uh, what's under the hood these days is just so intricately tightly packed right. to optimize on space. And if concrete is going to surround your system, it is going to grow as a factor of the third or something yeah, I as would your say, volume. Increase. I would say this: what actually needs to be in the hood? Yeah. Does everything that's in the hood need to be there? Like the battery, does it have to be in the hood? Under can, the hood? Yeah, okay, so what can you So you can move that out, right? So that's what we're looking at here. What yeah. can we remove that usually is in the reactor building? What doesn't have to be in the reactor building? Yeah. And make that new structure uh, optimized. And it's not to reduce system costs overall, it's really to go after the concrete because yeah. we know it's the biggest culprit. Yes. Um, one of the things that I think is a little crazy that the EPR tried to do was the opposite strategy for some reason. They made the biggest possible concrete structure in the entire universe for some reason. Um, <laughs> why, uh, why did they? It, clearly, they had some reason. They wanted to say, okay, if gases are expanding, the more volume we have uh, based on any heat input, the less pressure that these structures are going to take on. How do you get around that issue? Well, it's a that one. By the way, it's a giant plant. Like it's, I think it's seventeen hundred megawatt electric, yeah. um, and a PWR runs at a much higher temp pressure than a BWR. Yeah. Um, and we we do have a dry containment in this new reactor. We don't have the suppression pools, which are water pools inside containment that needs a lot of complex geometries to be supported. So we use the same containment philosophy, but it's a different design basis. So we are smaller because of a lot of different reasons. Uh, and then so then we also wanted to not have concrete be the pressure boundary, but metal be the pressure boundary because it's mm. easier to as soon as the concrete becomes the pressure boundary, it becomes really expensive. And so we also looked at our previous designs where we typically drew a bunch of systems and then we just I should not belittle what we've done, but and typically we drew like a square around it, and that was the reactor building. Yeah. If you look at the real estate and the quantities of that reactor building, it was pretty big, and the things that were in the reactor building did not necessarily need to be there. So we made this very expensive structure larger than it needed to be, yeah. and uh, it's the highest quality and the, by far the most expensive thing on yes. the whole project. What were some of the easy culprits to remove from the reactor? Uh, any any pumping system, right? Any pipe and pumps, you can right. overcome pump with the pump. You can overcome a weirder piping layout, let's say. And one of the things that you guys that is your advantage is this natural circulation dating all the way back to the early days of BWR when they didn't need forced correct uh, convection. Of, yeah, yeah. So it makes the reactor vessel taller, but we don't need to have internal reactor pumps or external reactor pumps. And taller is to create um, is to create what this is thermal this driving head. Yes, it's about differences in density and head and height. It's really the the natural circulation driving force. So we made it taller. We have what we call a chimney in there. So which is just a space of uh, a void basically in the middle, and you have solid water on the outside that drives the flow through the core. Got it. Um, and how big is this uh, this vessel? It's a uh, it's a small modular reactor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like twenty seven meters, I think it is. It's okay, pretty pretty, pretty yeah. big. Yeah, it's large. It's um, long. Is yeah. there is this one going to be one of those things that's built on a factory somewhere and then shipped out to a site? Well, they are now built that way, so we're expecting to build the updated vessel that way too. Yeah. And then does that limit some of the places that you could you have to like barge it to a site or something? Yeah, something. we would. Uh, we're still looking into this uh, and seeing if there's more optimization we can do to get it to be road transportable, maybe in, in pieces and doing the final assembly on site. There's a lot of actually here the advanced manufacturing and maybe EV welding can be used, but we're still looking into that. And we have our GE research people looking into how this vessel should be manufactured. And as anyone, one of the things I always thought was kind of a, a limiting 
uh, factor on the nuclear core itself was this requirement that the pressure vessel had to be like forged from one piece. Because if you could make it cold rolled and welded together, or you could put it in, in several sections that kind of just bolted and snapped together, you really could break it up and make it a lot easily more easily transportable. Does anyone push back on this requirement to have it forged? We're gonna forge certain rings and we're gonna roll plate other rings. Depends on the configuration and where it's located in comparison to the core. And why forged it all? From what, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I heard, it was based on this theory that under irradiation, a weld would perform worse than a, uh, than a seamless well, Ford. also, welds require inspections, so if you can eliminate welds, you save O&M costs. But couldn't one just tack on, because like the neutrons aren't going to come from any angle. You know where the neutrons are coming from. Couldn't one put like a, just a little extra inch of metal shield to absorb neutrons that would be coming directly at the weld and say, this is good enough? Uh, you, can, you can do things like that. I mean, that's been... That's been done. I mean, that was one of my one of my jobs at Palisades. Actually, was to do the fluence calculation, and we did a lot. Of, we had a lot of clever ideas on what we could put in the core to limit fluence at the welds. Uh, but it's better to not have that problem, at least in the core region. And I think with a new, we have a much smaller reactor vessel diameter. So now, in the past, we had basically made the forgings as large as we possibly could make them. There was only one place that could make them that large. Crazy supply but chain now, risk. But now we're in the ballpark of basically a PWR vessel, which is more readily available. Do we so there are forging houses all over that can do this size. Sorry to dwell on this, but the no well thing always bugs me, and it's nice to talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. Uh, <laughs> do we even know if that's true, that the welds perform worse under radiation? Have we taken apart an old reactor after it's been decommissioned and actually do like real examination of the weld? So at Palisades, we had welds that had no specification on certain impurities like copper, if I remember right, and nickel. And we did take samples from other places. And we did look at the uh, embrittlement of the metal from neutron. Uh, bombardment for that the fluence is causing the high high energy neutrons and there is an effect yeah but that's when there's um, possible weld contamination what if it was just the same material if it was just some sort of like laser weld same material yeah that I don't know how those methods would work here because you're not actually using a filler or an impurity so you would have to look especially if you can heat treat it you're basically marrying the intergranular structure between the two pieces right. into one. It's almost like it was Yeah, forced. it's almost like the welding is gone. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're looking into those technologies, but I, it's... Uh, In my head, I'm just like, I'm terrified of anything that requires custom transportation methods because right. that makes me think, uh, I don't know, no, just it's compounding expensive. It's effects. almost with, yeah. as expensive as the vessel itself to right. transport it to site, yeah, because you have to... Like, and also, in many cases, you have to redo the roads going up to a site. <laughs> right. It's in the big projects, it's kind of insane. Right, like how is that not requirement number one? Just like stick to something that can be easily transportable. Yeah, so we're looking at that. When you're talking about light water reactors, though, so, I mean, you're going to have a lot of high pressure and a big tank. I mean, like just that's the basic the name feature. Of the game. And yeah. we have, you know, in a boiling water reactor, we convert the steam inside the vessel. So it needs space for the steam to be created. We ah, don't need a steam right. generator, right? So we just we create the steam in the vessel and send it to a turbine. There's no intermediate cycle. And how come there isn't an intermediate? How come not, in order to cut down on the size of the vessel itself, why not have just a big pipe that then leads to a chamber and do all of your um, moisture removal in that chamber? And you then can, You can do the... that, but then you have welds and piping in between systems. Now, yeah. we like to have just one vessel where everything happens, and yes. then a turbine. And if you look at a simple um, plant with no difficult structures and uh, less area to that class one boundary, it's much smaller in a boiling water reactor than a pressurized water reactor, for instance, where you have the whole steam generator, two bundles. All that is like a pressure boundary for the primary system. In a boiling water reactor, it's the vessel. That's where everything happens. So you. By dividing it up, you have more complicated piping system, more welds, more more difficult construction. 
Because this, you lower the vessel, you attach the steam line, the feed lines, and whatever else you need to attach to run certain systems. But it's just a simpler way to do it. If you didn't work at GE and you were ideating this concept from scratch, mm -hmm. would you have still gone with a BWR or would it have been the same concept essentially but with a PWR? No, I would have gone with a BWR. BWR all the way. It, in my opinion, it has to be cheaper because we're not designing a huge heat exchanger. Those steam generators, plus they have to be replaced. I don't know if that's the case for the integral PWRs, but all PWRs that have been operated so far have replaced the steam generators. It's a huge expense. So, yeah. I mean, and you have all that heat transfer area in a steam generator that you need to treat as a pressure boundary. And that's another inspection kind of, it's a costly inspection. But I think in the history, you've seen that BWRs and PWRs have operated fairly similarly in terms of performance. So it's not a deal breaker. But I mean, if you're going to make a simple system, I mean, you can just compare the EPR simplified layout with a boiling water reactor, one tank. And EPR has a reactor vessel, four steam generators, a pressurizer, all this. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's all over the place. That's why it's so big. Crazy. I mean, the steam generators have to be inside containment, it's huge. The containment's giant. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's big. I, to me, it's to me, it's it just look at the two systems. And, and what and the what metal about? cost is cheaper for BWR, but that's not the one that breaks makes or breaks the project. The 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 cost that makes or breaks the project, I think, is that how do you get the plant in the ground, like the concrete, the whatever it is that you're using, metal or concrete in the yeah. ground digging. Yeah. Yeah. In general. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to visualize this. What about serviceability? So if you're trying to, if you're putting it underground, but you're trying to minimize the total volume, how do you think about, you know, at each fuel exchange, getting people in and out, getting equipment in and out? How does that work? Yeah, we're working out the the logistics and the layout, and we have uh, equipment hatches on at the bottom and the top and we're still going to be able to do the maintenance that we require. And still like in water channels to move things through and that all still fits? Well we in a boiling water reactor you just pull it straight up into a fuel, uh, fuel pool above. So it's not oh, right. so there's no like transfer of the fuel. You yeah, use the yeah. same machine to put it in the fuel pool as you're pulling out of the uh, reactor. So it's a little actually a little more compact. The ESPWR had a separate fuel building but we've for the BWRX, we're proposing to have the fuel building inside the reactor building at the top of the reactor vessel. And then, um, would this still be one of these plants that goes on for 80 years in theory, or is that design requirement shifted? <laughs> we, we're saying 40 to 60 years. Yeah. yeah but and if you can get the cost down, there's a case to be made for a shorter time period. I was going to say, it seems to me that um, it's, a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, this whole make it last long. Yep. Yes, you can play a game where your economics uh, look better because you get to divide it by more years. But then I just like with a discount rate and the cost of capital, I, like, I just don't see it. Like, I, I would say I've been a proponent for shorter life because uh, if we provide this product for less money, you don't need the long investment period, right? Yeah. It just makes sense. You get your you should get your return on investment much sooner. But there's it's heavy tradition too, so we're a little bit stuck in that. But yeah. Okay, so this has come up twice now. I want to hear about the cultural at do we have time? Yeah. I want to hear about the cultural aspect. Yeah. How it how how is it, you know, pushing because like you've got kind of a unique story and like I've now that I've you know had a couple of conversations with you, I can tell you just like think differently than a lot of people that I've met, uh, both inside and outside the nuclear community. But amongst engineers, you have diff like a very pragmatic, straightforward, easy to, um, it's easy to talk with you about ideas that are a little bit outside the bounds. So how does that work when you're back with your team and you have to push people to do things differently than the way things have already been done. What, what's that like? It can be, uh, I mean, we have some of the smartest people ever here in BWRs. We have the experts in pretty much any area. It's, I mean, other companies have experts too, but it's kind of amazing. Um, and so we have people with just extremely good historical knowledge and uh, 
what has been done, but what's so good about it, they know what's worked and what hasn't worked. So if you have crazy ideas, they can stop them like that doesn't work. Or, you know, we have these really good discussions. What it also does, it vets your ideas fairly well. As in, if I have a crazy idea and I vet it with these guys, I get a very good uh, set of technical comments or opinions at least that I, if, if I decide to go through with it anyway, we, I'm prepared for other arguments outside the business because <laughs> yeah. we've already gotten pretty good healthy like, well, What's a good discussion. example of that? Well, we have had uh, a lot of discussions on the, for instance, the natural circulation versus pumps. Because with a pumped plant, you can change power, but fa faster because you can change the pumped flow rate. I, I think we discussed it earlier, but so if you can change the pump flow rate, you can change the void fraction in the core and come down in power or come up in power pretty quick without moving rods. But we want to leverage the ESPWR licensing basis because it's approved and it's, it's much cheaper if you don't have to have uh, pumps. So we're basically, we had a very long and healthy discussion on pumps and no pumps for this plant. And, and it could be that it will have pumps in a future uh, <laughs> version, but right now it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that, yeah. to pumps versus no pumps, yeah, that, I mean, that obviously seems like a, like a master decision that drives Yeah, it drives a lot of design throughout the entire. A lot of, uh, a draw, it uh, leads to another, a lot of other decisions downstream. And what's another one maybe that people have said, oh, this isn't the way things have been done, but then you fire back with, but the world has changed or well, something like uh, that. In terms of safety classification and defense lines, we are looking pretty closely at the IEA way of safety classifying equipment and putting things in defense lines. What is defense line? Uh, it's, um, you know, nuclear has to be super safe. So we can't just be, have one safety system. We have to have a safety system and backup safety systems or control systems and safety systems. So in existing plants, we layer all these functions on top of each other. And we run probabilistic risk analysis to see, you know, how likely or how, how likely is this to cause a release, you know, this event. But we have all these redundant features. And what, what I would like to do from the beginning in this plant is to set up a framework where we have enough redundancy, but not too much. Yes to limit the consequences of any kind of initiating event. So we've set up a pretty rigorous defense line architecture for all systems, uh, mechanical, INC, and electric. And in order to then credit just the right amount of equipment and functions for each initiating event, both from internal and external events. And once you do that, you can set up a fairly nice uh, framework and you can list your safety function in each defense line, and then from that draw system classification. In the past, and actually in the US, you only have safety related and non-safety related. And there's this gray area, which people have treated different ways, where there's non-safety equipment, but you still have to have it like fire protected, seismic protected, equipped EQ, because it's important to safety, but not safety related. And it becomes kind of ad hoc that space in the middle, like not undefined, but hard to define. It's hard to trace your decisions on what ended up in that category and what kind of treatment you're giving it. So we're setting up a very rigorous defense line system to have a transparent decision making process for what, where things end up and how to classify it. And that's been a huge learning process for everybody involved. In, I mean, when we developed the system, it's been kind of a, it's a different way of looking at how you design a plant. But your plant's underground. Yeah. How could, uh, if you have a, a heavy top and it's underground, how could any radionuclides ever escape even in the case of a meltdown? It's a good question. Yeah, we, it's very, I mean, it's, uh, it's basically a cylinder with a, a pool on top. So, so even if it escapes into the cylinder, it goes up through a pool. But then, out. doesn't that mean every system, other safety system, is a redundant safety system? If if you have if you have it underground and it's sealed up, and you can show a model, any model that shows radionuclides can't escape, even in a case of a core meltdown, why do you need any other safety system? We have very uh, few safety systems. I mean, we have SCRAM. You need SCRAM. You need isolation. 
and you need some type of heat exchanger to remove the K heat. Yeah. It's fairly basic. That and is then good. the other stuff that you use to run the plant, which are pumped systems like feed water, shut down cooling, let's say reactor water cleanup, uh, uh, control rod drive, hydraulic system support, all that has a lower safety class. But they might have some backup functions for equipment failures or common cost failures. And then our system architecture is set up in just three tiers. So it's, it's actually fairly simple once you get into the details. But to get to the details and having it consistently applied, you need to set up the framework early on. And based on early conversations with regulators, are they are they okay with this? Are they? Yeah, I mean, um, it's not just your culture here that you have to change. You also have to change if they get through the regulatory culture, and you don't get to say, "Hey, we're all on the same team here right. every day." We haven't talked to the NRC yet. <laughs> but Let me know how that goes. Other, other regulators have been very open to this framework. They've liked it. And which regulators are the ones that are most open? Um, I mean, this fits Finland and the UK very well. Right, because Finland and the UK are characterized by being extremely, like they have their own rich nuclear culture and feel very confident to making decisions on their own. They don't have to look to the NRC or the IEA to, for guidance. They do it, they, they don't ask anyone, they, they're, they know their shit. And they're also very pragmatic people. You can sit down and have a reasonable conversation and they don't scream Alara back in your face. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to me like those are two pretty yeah, good Yeah, those are good regulators, but I mean, they're tough in their way too. Which I mean, ways are they tough? I don't know, Finland has a, they need to see a lot of information. <laughs> like yeah. it takes a lot of effort to get a project approved. I would say that if you talk to somebody that's implemented a project in Finland, they wouldn't say that Finland is the best way to go. Right, because the Okoloto. Yeah, yeah, but I would say that they've recently done it, so they can learn and they've at least executed the whole process through like yeah. the NRC is doing. So then the UK is a little bit tricky because they won't tell you exactly what they want. They will just tell you if they like it. That's a very British thing. They like thing. relevant good practice and you have to provide them relevant good practice. What is relevant good practice? Then? Something that's worked somewhere else. <laughs> 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 so that's hard, right? They don't really, is it relevant good practice? Yeah, it is. Okay, then it's good. It's, it's more of a dialogue, <laughs> it's kind of complicated. And I think for the UK project that we had with Hitachi, it was, we got through the general design acceptance criteria, uh, design acceptance very easily, but the site licensing was tougher. I don't know, it made a lot of changes, so it's hard, hard to make changes. And then Canada, they like defense lines too. They're very IEA centric, but not very similar to the US actually. Mm. Um, and they're open to rational like safety classification based on where the function is applied. Um, so so they're, they're, they're also very good. So there, there's, I, I don't know yet how NRC, but what I, how I did it was I said IEA has a kind of a good framework and we can always come up with country specific adaptations as long as we keep the decision making process transparent. And uh, you know, based on decisions and based on where you apply safety functions, things might change, shift between countries. As long as you are able to communicate the transparent process plus the country-specific adaptations, you should be able to tell the NRC that this should work. You just call the safety classification something different. And it's a little bit not quite similar to what they've already proposed, but in the, they have this a licensing modernization process. And maybe a little bit similar to that, but I think we, instead of like starting from scratch, we don't have to start from scratch. We've been designing a boiling water reactor. This is like <laughs> the tenth one. Yeah. We kind of know where things land yeah. in a boiling water reactor because we've done it before. So it's not like maybe one of the more advanced reactors where it's a little bit more of an open field because you don't know how the transient responses are on certain challenges for certain, you know, uh, reactor types that haven't been run. In a, while, in a while. Some have been run, but some haven't been. Timeline. Um, I, I mean, I, I love all of the, um, I love all of the different amazing, innovative, unique concepts for reactors that are out there. So many different startups. I, like, I, I love it. I love what's happening in this space. But one of my fears with many of the uh, not 
water-based reactors is just due to supply chain issues. Their timeline, their their timelines are just decades off. And material qualification. I mean, you got to build a whole industry about how you have a new metal alloy. You got to figure out how to weld that. I mean, that takes years uh, to develop codes and standards around. And that can take forever. But one of the reasons that I, I love your technology so much is that it's been done before and it's just figuring out how to make it cheaper. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of counting on you to save the world right now. Um, Oops. <laughs> so what's your timeline on that? So we um, right now, I think we're aiming for uh, late 20s, so 28 to 30. But of course, it depends on our performance. It depends on our customers uh, willing to help us develop the project, find a site, and so on. But it really depends on us performing and making what we, the, basically making the promise real that we're set out for ourselves. And what if I told you you had two years to have it built somewhere, not even not even uh, finished design? I'm saying two two years from today you needed this built somewhere. What uh, what would you need to make that happen? It's it. I don't think it's possible. Because you need. Look, let's uh, try that uh, question again. What, what what would it take to make that happen? <laughs> Seriously, I'm giving you the, I'm giving you all the world's resources. What what would you yeah. what, what do you want? So you have you have the U.S. government behind you. you have With whatever the exception you need. that it takes longer to make some of these pieces that we, if we disregard that, uh, we would have to have a firm commitment from a, a customer. We would have, have to have partners in place. We would have to have a site. You have to do site investigations. You have to come up with a site plan. The dig, you know, to figure out what. But some of these things, for the, the first one, some of these things should be short circuited. You could say, hey, we're going to put it right next to a plant that's already been built, or on sure. a plant that's about to be decommissioned while it's cooling down. Just put it on another site or something. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these things can be short circuited. I haven't heard anything that makes two years impossible. Mm. Yeah, I mean, licensing is also a long, not a two-year process. It's right. typically a two-year process to two to three years to do the preliminary safety analysis. Then there's two to three years to do You made it so clear with, your, with how you set up the safety. That, why is that? I, okay, so you haven't worked with NRC. I mean, like, right? Okay, I but you said you were a new plant. First of all, it's not. But the you said maybe you work with Finland, maybe you work with UK. Why not say I'm giving? I'm only giving you two years to get your first one out the door. <laughs> why not just go to them then and say let's let's sit down for a month straight every afternoon. We're going to spend with you, and I'm just going to walk through. Uh, how we've thought about this problem and the calculations we've already put together. Why does that take more than a month to sit down with another engineer and say it, it doesn't for an engineer, but it's not the point. I mean, you don't have to. You're not asking for an engineer to approve it. I, um, isn't that you're, what they hire in the? No, you're asking the commission to approve it. <laughs> <laughs> They're all political appointees. But aren't they just supposed <laughs> to listen to the engineers? I, I'm just saying there's a lot more factors than just technology. That's why yeah. otherwise nuclear would be successful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Otherwise we would have if it was just a technology. Okay, so issue. then why don't we go after the policy problem? If if the problem if the problem is it's difficult to get through a regulator, listen, if, if you're confident in safety, you weren't going to change the design based on what a regulator told you. You designed it to be safe to begin with. Why not just go to a place with no regulator? If the problem is that there's a commission, why not go to Uganda where there's no commission and just build it there? They need energy. They, they have people who are dying every day due to not energy. The risk for them to not build it right. is higher. Oh, no, I totally agree with you. So, um, but so why isn't that the game plan for two years? The game plan is to, well, the, remember the you thing, can't say it's the way it's always no, been done. No, but even <laughs> even in uh, places like Uganda. Uh, nuclear is just different because of the treaties that are in place. I'm just saying. I mean, like the, the Atoms for Peace was put yeah. in place uh, for a reason for non-proliferation and the, the use of nuclear for civilian. And yeah. it's a UN treaty. It doesn't go fast with new countries. Even if they have to have their own regulator. If that's not set up, it takes time. But it just takes time, unfortunately. I get it, but like we can't just when when I'm go in and build if it. I'm in the dairy industry, and there's international rules set milk about how much just... yeah well there's international rules about how you know how much milk I can move across. What I do though to get around those rules is I lobby, and I spend I invest the twenty million thirty million in political campaigns to get enough congressmen on my issue to change the rules, um, and it only costs twenty or thirty million dollars. When we're talking about billion-dollar reactors here, just yeah. why not just write it off as part of the marketing budget? 
That's, that's a good question. Yeah, so I think a lot of the, in the US at least, a lot of that's going on right now. I think it's, we're really working hard to make it make it possible to build the next generation nuclear plants, even whether it's ours or an advanced reactor. So that's really good. That's really changed. But a two-year reactor, at least this one, cannot be built in two years, even though we'd like to. I, I don't see it happening. I'm, no. cha I'm challenging you to think I different. Understand. No, I agree. <laughs> no, it's good. But we're trying, once the design and the site is ready, our goal is to yeah. have between two to three year construction time. Yeah. But it, the project going leading up to that is also a few years, including licensing and site preparations. But uh, yeah, I need to think about that one and cut, get back to you how I can get it done in two years. <laughs> I mean, the micros are different than yeah. the micro reactors, but these are still pretty big facilities that we're trying to build. You know, yeah. they're, they're pretty large. Um, as we wrap up here, I'm going to let you end on a, a more optimistic <laughs> note. <laughs> Tell me why this is important for the future of humanity. Oh, for the future of humanity. We've kind of noticed that if you're going to decarbonize and if you believe in climate change, you can't do it with renewables alone. Um, you have to have dispatchable clean power. And if you can provide dispatchable clean power at a price similar to or lower than what's currently the lowest power, um, you can actually achieve a decarbonized electric system and maybe also heat if you can figure out where district heating is used on a major scale. And I think that's, uh, I mean, to me, that would be a no-brainer, especially if you can reach the goal of uh, stopping or reversing climate change. Uh, that's that's what I, how I think we can do it. And what happens when plant is small, your number of customers go up too. Like if you can make this plant as cheap as we're expecting it to be, you have a lot of countries that can finance it, a lot of countries that can do the project implementation. Uh, for many countries in the world, a 10 or more billion dollar project would just be too big. They can't do it. But a $1 billion project has already been done, several probably in each country that we're looking at. So that's another reason to drive for cost. Cost, standing on our own basically feet without subsidizes without having to count on government policy because you are the low low or one of the lower cost alternatives for dispatchable power that's really the goal Christopher so, Dahlgren thank you so much thank you appreciate it